Uh, hello. Thank you. Yes, I'm from in Japan in a, a kind of exchange. And today I would like to speak about the organic foreign issue and how we can uh, lead this problem with the thermal remediation. When I speak about organic foreign, it's quite a huge group of different compounds. If I should be more specific, we can imagine like the PFAS, different pharmaceuticals and drugs as a anti-cancer drugs or agrochemicals, mainly pesticides. And we already know that most of these compounds has kind of health risk. In case of PFAS, it is cancer, it is change of spare quality, it is high cholesterol level. In case of anti-cancer drugs, it is the toxicity, bioaccumulative bio properties, or the pesticides are toxic and also persistent in the environment. So these compounds are uh, danger or can be danger. So that's what we don't want to have in the environment, don't want to have in the materials which we get in touch. Uh, so, and that's why it's important to measure them or analyze them. And when we can found these compounds, uh, we can we can found them in different waste materials, for example, in compost, in sewage sludge, and also on the field, like in the contaminant land, where it was the problem with some eco ecological uh, pollution or ecological problems in the past as a brown, for example, the RS brownfield or in the old, old mine areas, etc. And also in the different liquid waste as a leach, waste or different oils. So in these co compounds or in these materials, we can found them. And it's always depends now, what is the source of these compounds and where the, where we can find these materials? And why the organic fluorine compounds are a problem? Because uh, I specified them that they are PFAS, that they are different drugs. And the problem is that there are so many of different, different types and cogeners. For example, the PFAS, nowadays we have more than 9,000 different PFAS and their cogeners. And the number every year is increasing. So to analyze this would be expensive, will be difficult and will be time consuming. So we need kind of methods uh, when we want to analyze the organic flora and compounds in different materials, in the waste materials or normal, uh, for example, in the oil, uh, we need kind of easy analyze, analysis to get now if they are there or not. If they are not there, it's okay, it's not a problem. If they are there, we have to search for the special special substances. So if it would be in the old farm, I would search for pesticides. If it will be from the such from hospital, I will search more from the drugs and medicaments. And so this is one issue which we are struggling now because there is no methodology for this. And second issue is that uh, we, we have methods how to treat these materials. For example, what I'm doing, it's like the pyrolysis. And when we when we were dealing with pyrolysis, we deal with the PFAS and we know that PFAS, and as I will show you, uh, they are removed. But we didn't know if they are removed or just like break down and we can't analyze them. So pyrolysis, it's quite often used method for sewage sludge treatment, also for so soil and land remediation on the site, emit or for the waste plastic processing. So we use pyrolysis pretty often, but pyrolysis have still some issue which we would like to solve or which we would like to say they are not true. And one of this problem, it's like pro quality assessment that we need to have some quality assessments to, to clear if you want to salt material or like take material, you have to you have to have kind of quality limitations. And the second, there is lack, lack of legislation and lack of evidence that we, uh, the, the different pollutants in our case, like organic fluorine pollutants are removed. And what, and this we are doing, uh, we are doing, we have two units or two apparatus, one laboratory when we can measure between 200 to 700 Celsius in two hours in uh, our laboratory and second it's a big commercial unit in czech republic in trutnov which is operated for the sludge uh, which, which is treated in around 600 degree in oxygen free atmosphere uh, we already know that the sludge contains uh, different 
different uh, different PFAS. Uh, in this project or in this, it's not project, in this work, uh, we already measure in the two samples, one in unknown uh, wastewater pollution pump from small city, city, Czech city, sorry. And from the Trutnov, in both cases, the, the PFAS are available. And also we are able nowadays to measure the total flor fluorine content. So we plus minus know uh, what kind of, or how how much we have PFAS and the second, how, many total, how much total fluorine we have. And from the samples, we can already see that the uh, PFAS content after pyrolysis decreased under under the low level of quantification. So that's we can prove that from our analy analyzer PFAS, it is decreasing in its function. Also, the total total fluorine content is decreasing. Uh, in the laboratory experiments, it's about thirty percent. And we also can see we can also say that the total fluorine concentration it's increasing. So it's in the sample the salts, probably the salts of, of fluorine are concentrated. So PFAS are removed or mineralized, volatilized, or break down on the on uh, the the compounds which are not able to measure. Uh, total fluorine content is decreasing and uh, the concentration in the sample is in increasing. And that same we can prove in the uh, commercial units where it's nicely to see that again, the PFAS content is under under the limit of quantification. The removal efficiency is about 40% and the uh, uh, concentration of total fluorine uh, again increase in the samples. And we can see also that uh, in the slide that uh, removal efficiency is higher in commercial unit than in laboratory apparatus. And that's, the, that's why, uh, uh, because it's more dynamic environment uh, compared to our laboratory, uh, laboratory apparatus. So we can prove or we can, or we can make the efficiency better. In next slide, I have originally the results of organic fluorine. But I have to remove them today because uh, in a few days we run our valid validation. Sorry, and we and we unfortunately proved that our results was wrong, and we made made the mistake during the during our um, calibration and our analysis and during the analysis. And I will speak now more why, and I will a little bit move out move us to the theoretical mode. So. To the methodology, we already are able to measure the total, total fluorine content on the during the com, the combust material absorb and then analysis, uh, and it's same for the PFAS content, which we are able to without problem nowadays extract, purified, and analysis. Uh, we are every year in, in, like increasing the number of standards. Like nowadays, we have already 50, 57 standards in past years. In two years ago, when we have just 32 standards. And when we would like to measure the total organic fluorine, it's if when I will read it, extraction, fortification, solution treatment analysis, uh, and analysis, it sounds easy, but it's not easy because we are missing the standardization and validation because this method doesn't have some standards this method doesn't have kind of iso there is no uh, there is lack of the cooperation between different uh, laboratories and there is also lack of the of papers which are uh, dealing with this topic so in one hand the problem is that you have to extract the the pollutants materials as uh, you have to extract PF different PFAS, you have to extract the uh, agrochemicals like pesticides, and you have to extract the the drugs. And in second, uh, there is so many of them, so you have to choose and and make the extraction on your own, but with high lead of efficiency. And that's the problem because you have to make your own calibration or methodology, and we are not sure about losses. So. This is kind of challenging for us, but I, but we now came with the kind of idea how to 
how to validate our our methodology when we will like uh again uh, use kind of clean samples from us will be CSEN and through the CSEN we will able to make the determination val and validation of organic flora in the samples and then use the methodology for the sewage sludge. Uh, my conclusion has two parts. The first part is about the uh, organic fluorine and there is a kind of need to uh, measure this because nowadays there is a challenging that there is so many contaminants and it's very really expensive and demanding to uh, measure them all. So it will be easy for for the analytical or from the authorities when when they are able to have kind of first measurement and measure just organic fluorine and say organic fluorine is is there and we have to make deep analysis or no, we are without organic fluorine and we should focus on different 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 pollutants. But nowadays there is still lack of validation, lack of standardization, and there is few experience between the laboratories and between the research group. And that's the challenge we'd have to have to take. In our, in the second part, uh it's about the sludge. So we are fighting or we are like we would like to uh, say that the mistrust which is still in the uh, West Europe let's say or in the legislation of e European Union it's not necessary because the in some kind of condition the pyrolysis is good technology for the sewage treatment and we already confirmed that uh, the different organic pollutants are removed then the sludge quality it, it's up to 500 Celsius of treatment, it's pretty good or pretty high. Uh, that the uh, sludge, it's not not uh, environment problem or can't harm the nature or plant because uh, nowadays we already have that the uh, sludge from the Truth North Wastewater Treatment Plant has in own certificate by check authorities, 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 sorry, and it's possible to use it as a soil soil improver. But we have to prove that the PFAS which we are analyzing, analyzing are not just under limit of quantification, which means that they are minor, mineralized, they are volatilized, or they are just break down. But we have to prove that they are really not there and we're still missing it. But I hope that during the summer we will solve these problems. And when I say we, I would like to thank you to my colleagues from the UCT and also from the Institute of Environment, Charles University and Institute of Microbiology, uh, Czech Academy of Science, which we are uh, dealing this issue. Okay, thank you for your... Yeah, thank you very much for your nice presentation. So we have, we have time for two short questions from the audience, so please. Yes. So I would have a question. Uh, Maybe a too naive one, so I'm sorry in advance, but I don't really understand how you can uh, decrease the flu total fluorine uh, content. So where where so I, I suppose that you are comparing the, the content in the original slide with the chart, which uh, yes. you get from the by the pyrolysis. So where does the fluorine go? When it's not in the chart, so where, where, uh, where you, you, you mean you mean why this number increase? If I'm understanding your question. Mm -hmm. uh, well, ah, okay, because I understood that uh, you like have the re removal of that. Uh, so yeah, this I'm a bit confused. Like you see, yeah, yeah, yeah. showing fluorine removal efficiency. Uh, so in the sludge, there is lower content. Uh, so I suppose that the char uh, has a smaller uh, like. Yeah, 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 yeah. I understand your question. So that's why it's increasing, but where, where is the why, why removal? So I'm, I'm lost. Yeah, 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 yeah. I understand you for your question. Thank you for this. So uh, we have the concentration in the input material and in output material. And the increase is because the uh, during the pyrolysis, the organic matter is removed. 
and uh, and the organic and the fluorine <clears throat> is staying in the material, but it, it and and in staying not in probably in high probability it's staying as it's some salt, but not in the organic uh, in the organic form. So that's why uh, because the organic matter uh, remove easier and more than the fluorine, so the the content in the like per gram increase, but if I if we look on what we have in a con in the content in the sample which we put in the uh, let's say in the machine or which we use, we can measure after recalculation what was on the what was in the input material and output material. So uh, in total, the amount decrease because uh, some of the fluorine volatiles. Uh, with the off gas out or volatiles with the off gas, but as the organic matter is removed during this process, the amount of material at the end is lower. The reduction of material is like forty percent, sixty percent depends on the sludge, and that's why the organic fluorine per gram increase. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. So the time is over. We have to shift to the next presentation. So thanks once more to the speaker. Thank you. Please, please stop the sharing of your presentation. So we should go forward. So the next presentation will be given by Ms. Kapurova and the title of her speech is Hazardous components, a case study in textile waste management. So, if we start sharing. Yeah. Start. It does not work. Yes. Like I can, I can. Yeah. Yeah. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, good afternoon, dear committee. Uh, my name is Anastasia Shtukaturova. Uh, today, I would like to introduce you the second part of my research uh, that is related to textile waste, and it is assessment of toxic compounds in textile waste. Uh, firstly, uh, about presentation structure, I will give you some general information about the toxicity of textile products. Then I will continue with main reasons to be focused uh, on this topic. Uh, I will introduce you experimental part and I will finish with uh, conclusions and summary. Uh, so I have already shown you this uh, schema and uh, you have already known that there are some impacts that are related to textile industry. But uh, today I would like to be focused only on one and this is the use of toxic chemical compounds. And uh, this impact is uh, closely connected with uh, water, soil, and air pollution. The textile industry, if we are speaking about uh, manufacturing industries in general, the textile industry is responsible for 5% of uh, chemical sales and rents second globally. For comparison, uh, on the first place is plastic and uh, rubber industry. So maybe for plastic and rubber industry, it's obvious like that they use lots of chemicals, but where all these chemicals appear in uh, textile industry. And for this, I've prepared uh, two schemas. The first one is a brief uh, summary of production and manufacturing uh, processes of uh, different textile products. And it starts with raw materials where different 
uh, raw materials production where different filterizers, pesticides are used and continued by fiber production, yarn spinning, fabric manufacturing processes, different wet treatments where sizing uh, agents, pining uh, oils, different detergents, uh, dye stuffs are used. I want it to be more concrete. So uh, I've tried to find like uh, specific chemicals that are used, for example, to produce only one piece of garment. And I should say that it was rather a challenging task because there is a huge uh, research gap um, on the topic of content of chemicals in textile products. Um, I found some information and here I have examples, but we don't have time to go through all of them. But I should say that there are several points that connects all these chemicals and that all these chemicals are harmful or mostly harmful for uh, humans health because, because of carcinogenity or mutagenity, or they are ecotoxic because they have they are highly bioaccumulative and um, uh, do not compose uh, in the environment. So uh, how do these uh, toxic substances get into the environment? Uh, maybe it's clearly with a uh, production step where toxic compounds could be a part of effluents, but I would like to be focused on end-of-life textiles. And um, the first part of my research uh, was about material flow analysis. So we've uncovered that uh, textile waste in, in the Czech Republic is mainly uh, recycled, recycled or landfill. So in the case of recycling, um, recycling of textile waste in general is a very complicated process and a known content of chemical compounds even more hampers this process. Uh, but uh, today I would like to be focused on landfilling because it's also a big part of utilization of uh, textile waste. So if we are speaking about landfilling, toxic compounds can reach the environment through evaporation and leaching. And if we are speaking about evaporation, it's uh, mainly toxic effects. So uh, toxicants reach a uh, human's body with uh, skin surface or inhalation. Or if we are speaking about leaching, it's mostly ecotoxic effect. And here, as an example, I have pollution of soil and water resources. So why to be focused on determining the toxicity of textiles? <clears throat> we have already discussed uh, several points, like huge consumption of different chemicals, absence of complex research, chemical releases to the environment. But uh, I also want to mention the other important point and its weak regulations, because maybe you will ask yourself, like, if all the substances are so toxic, like, why don't we have regulations for them? And I will answer you. We have regulations, but only uh, in European Union, but textile supply chain is very long and very complex. So lots of compounds, uh, different parts of textile products are coming from Asia. So mostly they don't have uh, regulations like REACH or persistent organic pollutant regulations. So we don't know uh, what exactly uh, comes to the European Union and in our case to the Czech Republic. So reasons to study this topic, I guess that obvious, but where to start, how to start. Um, we decided uh, to start with Firstly, with literature overview, uh, continued by experimental part, uh, and experimental part is introduced by uh, percolation or leaching test. Uh, here I have a schema uh, adapted for our uh, uh, reactor, but uh, the principle of percolation test could be also discussed through this schema. So uh, you have a reactor with uh, needed uh, waste, in our case, it's textile waste with radial water supply that allows the release of different toxicants and sampling takes place uh, according to the harmonogram of your research or according to different regulations. 
uh, I have not only the schema, but we have already built uh, an equipment uh, for our experiment. It took us some time, but uh, now we're ready uh, to start with experiments. And our reactor is uh, in some case unique because if we are speaking about uh, percolation, simple percolation death, it used for um, acutoxicity, uh, acutoxicity, you can put only from 10 and a half to 10 kilograms of material into it. This material <laughs> should be milled. And while milling, you can destroy the matrix. And uh, while milling, you, have, you can have secondary contamination. So in the case of our reactor, uh, the mass of waste could be from 30 kilograms. We don't need uh, to do pretreatment. And uh, this milling process is also very energy consumptive. So uh, we skip this issue. Duration time is 80 days. Of, to compare with uh, a normal percolation test, normal percolation test takes place only from one to five days. And we will also follow the temperature of water. It's going to be 13 degrees. Uh, it's the same temperature for effluence at uh, normal landfill. Uh, we would like to follow synergic effect of toxicants and to be focused on heavy metals and uh, PFAS. So uh, project advantages, uh, they are that we have special and unique equipment. Uh, we will have detailed and co complex analysis of toxic components, and uh, we can control the limiting standards for uh, textile products. And quick summary for my presentation. So textile products use large amount of chemicals. Chemicals harm the environment and human health. Chemical assessment regulations not enough nowadays. And chemical content in textiles should be under investigation. Uh, thank you for your attention. And mm -hmm. I'm open for your questions. Yeah. Presentation and how we have time for yeah, a couple of questions. So, please, the first. Uh, thank you for the last talk. Uh, well, I think you had a nice presentation uh, of the topic, but not so much for that uh, to your experiment result. Why you go to the first year of your PhD? I'm not the first year of my PhD. It's the second part of my research. The first part was related to material flow analysis. So we built uh, the equipment only three months ago. So now we're ready to start with experiments and I'm waiting for uh, samples from partner organizations. So we will start with the experiments as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, well, at this stage of your research, wouldn't it be very important to define uh, what's your textile was? Because I guess that it's going to be very different having cotton fabric waste rather than synthetic things. Very, With, very different. So I guess that it's, a, it's going to be a hard work. It's going to be a hard work. And in the moment that this waste will reach landfill, you won't differentiate if it is cotton or if it is synthetic material. So we want to follow like all the chemical, all the possible effects and uh, uh, get chemical behavior over this waste uh, at landfill. I know, but we, we want to try. Yeah, <laughs> no, there are no results, so it's difficult to find any question, but still you, you, you present the temperature will be maintained at 13 degrees. Yeah. Would you, how, how will you be maintained at this temperature? With a thermostat. It goes in the scheme or? No. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but you mentioned that you took this temperature according to according the, to the it, common temperature. According to common temperature of landfill effluent. Right. And so uh, about the, the conditions for this test, so you do you plan to use water only or will you play with some parameters like, for example, pH? Because, uh, for, for now, are not, not... 
I know. For for now, uh, we are trying to um, to have this experiment with other ways, and according to the result that we have with other ways, we will adapt uh, textile ways. So we will play with pH, with uh, the temperature. We will have constant, but we will have water, and we will play with pH. Yes. Sorry. So the time is over. You, you have to go. And thank you. Again, next speaker is Mr. Bradley, and the title of his talk is Investigation of Recycling Possibilities of Discarded Photovoltaic Solar Panels. So, So, oh, Mr. Schperli, we start with your presentation. Click on the screen, I guess. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I it's very much a lot of I think I can go. We to <laughs> so, uh, good morning. Thank you. My name is uh, Antonio Sparli, and as you can see, my uh, topic is solar panel recycling. And the first uh, main question is why we should recycle these panels. The answer is in this graph. Uh, because nowadays, in year 2023, the production from solar panels is around uh, 500 uh, uh, gigawatts globally. And uh, after uh, 25 years, the prediction say, that uh, the production or capacity of this uh, solar panel uh, will be more than uh, four and a half thousand of uh, uh, dollars. Uh, this uh, 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 increasing capacity is closely bonded with the uh, production of waste solar panels. Now, the now. Uh, uh, we have around uh, 50,000 uh, tons of uh, solar panel waste, but uh, after 25 years, uh, in the 2015, uh, it could be from 60 to 80 uh, million tons globally. Uh, when we want to recycle, we have to think about the structure and uh, in the left picture, uh, we can see the sandwich structure, which consists from uh, glass. Uh, then it's a uh, 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 polymer, uh, 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 ethylene, uh, uh, vinyl acetate. Uh, uh, middle layer is from uh, silica cells and uh, metal uh, wires. Fourth layer is the same EVA. And uh, the back sheet is from polyvinyl chloride, and the commercial name for this is Terlar. The next step is uh, to know what is the mass balance of the solar panel. And uh, clearly, we can see that three quarters of the panel is, is, is uh, glass, by the way. About 12% uh, 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 are uh, polymers, and the rest are metals. Uh, 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 with with the silicon. And, uh, also, we have to think about the value of, of components. 
and uh, this right pie, ch pie chart uh, was made by uh, um, uh, uh, multiplying uh, weight of the component by its value. And uh, in this graph is uh, 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 interesting that uh, silver takes almost half of the value of, of the solar panel. The rest are the rest are uh, metals, and uh, about eight percent eight percent is glass, and uh, this fact is given by the high content of, of the glass. Uh, uh, the whole solar panel consists uh, also from a uh, metal frame and junction box. And now I will talk about uh, possibilities how to recycle them. Uh, the, but the best first step is to uh, remove these two things by hands. And uh, the product will be the whole so, uh, 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 solar panel which could be treated by tearing into smaller pieces or and uh, crushing and uh, milling to uh, uh, recover glass. Uh, other possibilities are uh, 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 recycling uh, with uh, chemical change, for example, by pyrolysis. Pyrolysis is uh, useful for uh, EVA polymer because EVA doesn't uh, contain any harmful compounds. Uh, other possibility how to uh, 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 delaminate the solar panel is by uh, uh, organics, uh, by soaking in organic solvents. And uh, interesting uh, method is combination with uh, super uh, critical carbon dioxide, uh, which will soak the, the polymers and uh, uh, by decreasing pressure, the structure will break. Uh, for the metals, is uh, used for leaching by acids. And the biggest problem is with the back sheet because it's fluorinated and uh, it uh, doesn't want to react and uh, pyrolysis or combustion is really harmful to, to nature. Uh, now I will move to our goals and also results. Uh, on this uh, work, uh, we cooperate with uh, private companies and uh, this work will be part of uh, 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 um, a European project. And uh, on the beginning, I started with theoretical research to find out uh, how many solar types do we have, uh, what is the possibilities to, to do with them, and also uh, look, uh, to study some uh, uh, patterns and uh, books. And uh, the next my part is to know the mass flow in the Czech Republic, means uh, current market, which we cooperate with its companies. Uh, I also perform some uh, uh, experiments. They were focused on chemical composition on our real sample of, of the solar panel, then choosing uh, the uh, 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 valuable components and the main target is to design and uh, build a uh, real scale unit for treating uh, based uh, uh, solar panels and that means choosing the right uh, methods and right uh, order of them and also think about pollution, safety, loss, etc. Uh, these are results. So I started uh, me um, uh, 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 measuring the uh, wires and uh, uh, the, the, the silica cells by an uh, 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 fluorescence because it's fast, easy, and in the wires uh, we can find the copper, which is typical for conductors. There is also silica, 
and uh, metals for uh, uh, soldering, but increasing value is more, more than 4% of silver. Uh, the same, uh, the same uh, uh, method was used for the silica cells. There's the, the main component is silica and also uh, the content of uh, silver. Uh, then I need two more precise methods, which is ICP uh, OS. First, for blue uh, bias, uh, three samples of uh, uh, these wires were uh, almost uh, uh, digested. And uh, these more precise uh, 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 results uh, confirm our, our uh, 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 preliminary test that the device uh, consists from uh, copper, solder, and also uh, quite high amount of, of uh, silver. If we look on the silica cells, the percentage of digested uh, was uh, much smaller because the silica was uh, digested. And uh, also, we can see high amount of uh, the silver. Now we are working on the mass balance because uh, one of the main uh, part is also create something like a, 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 a library for the solar panels. So when we know uh, when when we measure different panels from different years and different producers, we can before the treatment say. From this panel, we can get these products in this amount. So our goal is to this graph, and uh, uh, it starts with uh, sample preparation because the sample must be uh, uh, representative. So we have to cut some some sample from. From the panel, can weigh it. Then, uh, uh, boiling in water, we can get rid of the glass. Boiling in toluene under the uh, cooler, uh, Eva gets swelled, and uh, we can by tweezers remove the wires and the back sheet from it. And uh, in this uh, right part, there are the produce uh, 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 produce what we can weigh and if we sum these uh, numbers uh, uh, we can calculate the content about which will burn in, in the furnace and as a conclusion uh, solar panel seems to be a really perspective source for urban mining and uh, also we can assume that uh, government will be forced to recycle more. And these are references and that's you. Well, something for the questions from the audience. So the lady first. Thank you. Um... So you mentioned different types of solar panels, but then you focus on the on the one. Why is that? Uh, one of the main uh, result from the theoretical research was that uh, from ninety to ninety five percent of uh, current uh, market are uh, these type of uh, solar panels. Anthony, uh, seems from the figures that you showed us is that the, the, the interesting point is in, in the silver, mm -hmm. the wiring. Why not to find a way of dewiring the solar panel panel before and, and forget about mix, mixing everything? I mean, dewire the solar panel, and then, there you have the, the, the silver. Isn't it? Do you mean the wires which are? Uh... From the junction box? Uh, I don't know. I mean, yeah, yeah. Where yeah. Actually, yeah, the solar is the wire. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, what I would do is to dewire the solar panel. Okay. 
work with the with the with the wires. So I forget about the rest of this. Yeah. Because the copper is also in the in the wires. Uh here is uh, copper. That's that's uh, normal cables. And the silver is mostly here in the middle of, of the panel. Mm. And uh it's problem to get the metals from the middle of of the polymers. And uh, also there are some laws uh, which says that uh, when you have to uh, 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 recycle something, you must recycle uh, some part of of the, the or or most of the of the waste, and not just take the wires and throw out the. Uh, um, well, it depends how you want to focus it because uh, one thing is uh, doing a life cycle analysis of the of the whole thing. Or what I thought that you were doing is to go for the economic incentive, isn't it? Mm -hmm. In getting the most money out of the recycling, I would go for the silver. For the silver. Forget about the <laughs> <electric parts and laughs> Probably, can be. Very different of you, that would be uh, the alternative. Okay, I had very similar questions. So it's basically not possible to like separate the layers. It's so much like uh, I don't know, like uh, we move together. Move together <laughs> that you cannot like because this would solve partially the problem no? to, mm -hmm. to just separate the layers and then recycle them separately. Uh, basically, it's uh, it's possible, for example, by by the toluene to put it in in the toluene, and uh, you can get the whole uh, glass. Uh, and the back sheet and the mixture, uh, the mixture of polymers and the metals. But uh, every metal treatment has pros and cons. So it's possible to uh, 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 delaminate the layers. But for example, working with toluene in big scale is, is a problem because it's a really uh, 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 flammable liquid. And uh, this process uh, takes a long time. But you, you are anyway intending, intending to use the toluene. Uh, toluene was used uh, only for the in in a lab uh -huh. when we want to know the mass balance of the panel and cut and use these numbers for calculations. But yeah. in in the real scale, it. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. You may go to the last presentation of the morning session. So, Ms. Tedmihradská is going to speak about the biochar production utilization properties of biochar. Share your presentation. Great. You can start. Good morning. Hello. Uh, my name is Aneshka. Click on the presentation. Now you have to click on the presentation first, and then you go to click the words. It's okay, you should, you know. Oh, how you look? No. And <laughs> so now you can see that my name is Aneška Smihradská, and I work under the supervision of Michal Pohřeli, and I will talk about properties and the bonds <laughs> high temperature biochar. Um, okay. So uh, why studying in, uh, biochar is so important? As you can see in this picture from International Biochar Initiative, uh, one of the main benefits of, of biochar is uh, that it can uh, capture carbon in soil. And that is very important if European Union is really serious about uh, uh, being climate ne climate ne neutral by 2050. Uh, another um, 
institution called Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change uh, says that uh, biochar has huge potential, but there's lack of knowledge and there needs to be more research on this topic. Uh, biochar is a broad term and uh, there are a lot of types of biochar and that, that means that they have different properties and they are mainly influenced by process temperature and uh, biochar particle size. Uh, different properties mean different benefits. Uh, so we need to find uh, uh, specific biochar types for specific process they are, uh, it is used in. Uh, and as we are in Czech Republic, uh, we focus on the biochar that has the highest water and nutrient retention in soil. That's why we uh, focus on high temperature biochar because it has a most developed uh, porous structure and can retain most water and nutrients. Uh, but one of the one of the uh, disadvantages of high temperature biochar uh, is that when it is fresh, it's actually highly hydrophobic. So we need uh, we need to this biochar to lose this property and it that is done by process called activation or oxidation. And uh, in the big scale, uh, nowadays is done by composting biochar and then using as a soil amendment. This process is quite well studied, uh, but we uh, focus on two different, I focus on two different uh, processes. One of them is using biochar as a feed additive and the other as a anaerobic fermentation additive. Then uh, after these uh, processes, uh, biochar is hopefully activated and then used as a soil amendment. And I uh, want to study uh, the behavior of biochar in these processes and um, why, uh, if it influences these processes and, and if it does, then why. And I want to also compare the properties of biochar to co composted biochar. As I said, it was uh, studied before. Uh, so we we uh, chose the high temperature biochar. Then we needed to uh, choose the particle size. Here you can see that the the smallest particle size under uh, 0.5 millimeters has uh, uh, very different properties. It had much higher ash content and subsequently different pH value and lower carbon content. So we eliminated the smallest. Uh, uh, size fraction and used particles that were uh, bigger than 0.5 millimeters. Then we uh, determined molar, uh, um, hydrogen to carbon molar ratio. Um, as you can see, it is uh, dependent mainly on the pyrolysis temperature uh, and uh, all, because all of the uh, results for, for all of the size fractions were this, the same and uh, here indicated by the flower. Um, this smaller ratio is uh, uh, important to, uh, to determine the stab stability of biochar inside soil. The lower the ratio, the longer uh, the biochar will stay in the soil. Um, then we did uh, infrared spectroscopy, and you can see that there are no uh, functional groups on the surface of biochar. So we concluded that a particle size does affect carbon uh, content and structure and ash content, which subsequently uh, influences pH, electrical conductivity values, and metal contents, and it does not affect biochar stability in soil and functional groups on surface, which is good for uh, our purposes. Now, what uh, biochar does inside soil? Um, as you can see he here in this picture from literature, uh, it says uh, biochar influences a lot of the soil biome. Um, uh, we uh, uh, use this literature uh, as a reference for our processes of biochar as a feed additive and as an anaerobic fermentation additive 
as uh, there are microorganisms as well, and the biochar will end up in the soil in the end. So that's why we use uh, literature that focuses on biochar inside soil as a reference. Um, here are uh, some photographs of biochar that uh, was in the uh, cow's lumen. Um, uh, it was put inside the cow. And uh, yes, you are laughing, but uh, it actually was. And uh, it was uh, held there for uh, six uh, up to 192 hours. Uh, and after this time, half of the sample was dissolved. Uh, around uh, the 48 hours, there was a, a peak of microorganism colonies. It, 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 you can see that it was highly populated. It was disorganized. Uh, but then uh, the colony started to shrink. And as some uh, types of microorganisms probably dominated, uh you can see that the structures uh, started to be uh, more re regular uh also we did infrared spectroscopy and uh there was a slight increase of carbonyl peak in the uh, samples that were uh, uh in the room and the longest here are some photographs of biochar uh, from batch anaerobic fermentation the structure was uh, appeared to be cracked, and you can see that the microorganisms inhabit the pores that are close to the edge of the particle and not like in inside. So that means that probably smaller particles will uh, uh, behave uh, like um, behave better in in the in the process of fermentation. Then uh, there were continuous uh, anaerobic fermentation experiments that uh, in, that uh, concluded that uh, biochar increased biogas production, although it didn't increase biogas uh, quality. So we uh, had to go back to batch anaerobic fermentation uh, to actually see why uh, it is affecting the biogas production because we cannot extract biochar from the continuous process. Uh, so con my conclusions are that the biochar benefits to anaerobic fermentation. We have three hypotheses that we want to um, test. Well, one of them is that biochar is simply a physical carrier of microorganism and it, microorganisms, and it provides them a living environment. Uh, second is that it uh, increases buffering capacity of the liquid. And the last one is that the biochar, uh, especially the high temperature one, which has the most developed uh, crystalline structure, uh, can increase electron transfer among the microorganisms. So it helps them grow. And um, uh, during the uh, using biochar as a feed additive, it actually decreased milk production but the activation did occur. So there is a question if the biochar should be used in a different type of animal. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, so. I, I have First. a question actually. So you partly probably uh, answered it uh, in, in your conclusion, but I suppose it's on everyone's mind. How exactly did you put biochar in this pal? Yes, uh, did you make it I have prepared a picture for that uh, uh, question. <laughs> uh, this is a cow that has a hole in uh, that that connects to its woman. Oh so God. it was actually put inside the cow. First is that, that ethical? <laughs> the first uh, set of experiments, it was actually used as a feed additive. So it was found that uh, it decreased the milk production and stuff, and then we put samples inside the rumen and extracted it after uh, set uh, time periods. Okay, and so what about the ethicality of such a process? Uh, that that uh, falls into um, not my expertise, but expertise of our colleague uh, that has uh, okay. 
I think you should know about this. I mean, that's that's quite important. But anyway, uh... it is possible to do so. Yeah, I'm, 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 <laughs> humans even so uh, it well, doesn't mean they, 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 are, they are studying uh, other feed additives and uh, types of uh, feed okay. uh, like that so they can uh, increase the milk production even okay. more so they right. have four cows and they have special medical treatment and they I actually see uh, I actually saw uh, our colleague reaching inside the cow okay. and cow was the cow was eating during yeah. this process okay. it didn't mind at all thank <laughs> <laughs> you yeah please next question uh nice call i was interested um whether the, um, the biochar can be used as a replacement for the meat of the drivers or some you know, uh yeah uh so uh, biochar especially the high temperature one is uh, mainly carbon it is around uh, 90 or even more percent of carbon so it doesn't provide the nutrients itself but it only retains them so it cannot be used as a fertilizer itself about the the rest so the ashes content so it's basically some minerals yes. so this cannot contribute to the uh, nutrition of the plant so uh it depends on their bioavailability but um some of them dissolve and some of them don't and uh um it it also depends on the microbiome and on the plants uh, on uh, how they uh actually uh, crack down the the biochar particles. It's uh, like themselves. I guess on the original this was uh, uh, to be my my question regarding the uh, the development of the biofilm in your in your mm -hmm. okay last experiments. If one of the reasons why it's beneficial <laughs> cannot be like supply with kind of some minerals basically for the for the microorganisms. Because the content of the ashes is pretty high, it's like I don't know, ten to fifteen percent or something like that. Uh, yeah, it's it, um, in the in the. Uh, I have to, I think, play it from the beginning because I had it on the same slide. Uh, the ash content uh, was uh, was high only for the smallest fraction, and then it was uh six percent and less. Last question. What do you mean by pH of the biochar? Is it like a oh, it's point? it's it's pH of the water. Uh, it is it's yes, uh, it like uh, it's uh, one to ten uh, uh, ratio of biochar to water. So it's it's pH of this uh, liquid solution. Solution is. Mm -hmm. I'm satisfied.